morning, and let's go to the book of Ephesians, chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. There was a man and his wife who were talking, and the man was unsure about his choice of clothes for church, so he sought some counsel from his wife. He asked her, do you think I should change? Well, the wife, being sharp, took advantage of the opportunity and replied, well, it depends. Are you talking about changing your shirt or making a wholesale change as a human being? <laughs> Ouch, huh? <laughs> you know, we as people often don't think we need to change, do we? Do we? You know, the problem isn't with me. It's everyone else in the world that just needs to change. I, I had a relative one time, he said, you know, I, I just wish everyone in the world was just like me, who had another relative replied, then the place would be a really, then the world would be a real boring place, wouldn't it? And they kind of stepped back from that comment. We never think that we need to change, but the truth of the matter is that if we don't change, we will not grow spiritually. Because if we're going to grow spiritually, we have to be willing to change. That we can't just stay where we're at, where we're at today, but we've got to allow God to mold us and to make us into the person He desires us to be. It's a necessary part of the Christian life. And resistance to biblical change, well, that just frustrates. That just frustrates God's working in our lives meant to bring us to higher levels spiritually and bless us abundantly. I'm not saying that it's not, it's always going to be comfortable, because a lot of times when we're changing, it's because there's character qualities that are changing about us, habits that are changing about us, mindsets that maybe we've had for decades have to change. It's not always comfortable to change, but it's necessary. And it's, and it's an important part if we want to go higher for God, if we want to see God do some things in our life, if we want to see God use us, then we've got to be willing to change. And being resistant to that change will, again, only frustrate God's working. That's only designed to bring us to better places in our Christian walk. Ephesians chapter 4, we'll pick it up verse 17. The Bible says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. The willingness of our souls to allow God to change us will determine will be the determinant factor in our spiritual growth. For without change, we will never be Christ-like. So today I present to you a very simple equation. And I'm not a math major, it never was. I was on the opposite end of the spectrum. But this is a very simple equation even, even us in, in that category find ourselves in. It's simply this. Growth equals change. Growth equals change. Let's pray first. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the truth of the Word of God here today. And I do pray, Lord God, I know you're working on changing every person here, including myself, in some regards. But Father, I just pray that today that our hearts would be humble and receptive to the things that are going to be taught so that that godly change can take place, that you could strengthen the, the convictions in the hands of those that sit here today so that they can glorify you and that you would help me glorify you in a way that pleases you. Lord, help us to change, especially in those stubborn areas that we all have, so that we could be more like your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a story told about a doctor who was examining a patient of his, and, and the patient had a lot of health problems, and a lot of it was due to his diet. And the, the doctor said to, to his uh, 
patient there. He said, you know what? You're going to have to make some changes in your diet. He said, you're going to have to give up, give up red meat for a while. And the man just loved red meat. He, he had a hard time with that. He loved his hamburgers. But he got thinking a little bit. Red meat, red meat. When I cook the meat, it's brown. So he stopped instead of making his meat red by stopping, uh, by not putting ketchup on it anymore. You know, some people don't want to accept their need to change sometimes. I'll just not put ketchup anymore on my red meat. You know, it'll make it a little less red. It's like, you know, that's not change. <laughs> but sometimes that's the way we are when it comes to change. However, without change, there is no growth. You, you and I cannot grow spiritually without some levels of change. And God knows the exact change agents to bring into our lives. Because God's got one goal in mind for every single born-again Christian here today. And that's us to look like Christ. Now, I'm not talking physically, but spiritually, emotionally, our character. To be molded into a one that reflects the Lord Jesus Christ. We've seen this verse many times throughout this series, Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You know, God in the eternity past, whom he did foreknow, those he knew would get saved. Not that he chose to get saved, but he knew that would. Determined in eternity past, the goal that he was going to have for each of their lives was that they would be conformed or molded or shaped or made into the image of Jesus Christ. In other words, they would become Christ-like. They would imitate him uh, very cleanly. But of course, that's going to require some changes in our lives, isn't it? That's going to require us to be different people than when he finds us at salvation. And God will be doing much to orchestrate that change, whether we like it or not. Sometimes we don't always like it, do we? I'll be the first to admit that. I don't like these changes. I don't. But but God will do a lot of things. You know what? God will frustrate our, our manipulation to get us to change. You ever try to do something and, and think that you, for for lack of better terminology, think you got away with it, but only God allowed it just to blow up or burn up in embers? Why? Because God will, God will uh, make sure that He changes us into the place that He wants us to be. You know, that's why He brings the troubles in our lives, to, to change us as people. And, and sometimes we really stubbornly resist that, don't we? We really do at times. But He's, he's interested in our spiritual growth. And he will bring about the things necessary in our lives to orchestrate the necessary changes he wants to see. And for every person, that's different. Because we're all unique individuals. We all have unique personalities. We all have unique strengths and weaknesses. And God knows the, uh, knows the calculations and knows all the little intricate details about every one of us. To know what things are going to be necessary in a life to bring about that molding process of making us into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, there is a part that we have. It's called surrender. It's called being surrendered to that change. In other words, God, go ahead. And, you, and when you think about it, that's a little scary, isn't it? Go ahead, God. <laughs> it's like, ah, you know. Go ahead. What, what, what you got to do, go with it. It might be a little scary on the outside, but we're better off in the long run. Why? Because Romans 8.28, the verse previous, verse 29 to this one, it says, For all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. And it's followed by that. In other words, God orchestrates things in our life to conform us in the image of Him, not in a sense to beat us up. Even when God brings judgment, if you will, or the spiritual spanking that we sometimes all, we all need, God will use those things for a positive outcome. Everything God does is for a positive outcome. Even the negative things He allows is always designed for a positive outcome. 
There's nobody here that God hates. And some Christians have that mentality. I, I, where they get it, I, you know, is there's a long explanation, I'm sure. But oh, God just hates me. God, God just beats on me. God, no, no, He doesn't hate you. There's, you can't find a verse in the Bible that says God hates you. He loves you with an everlasting love. Sometimes we take advantage of that. I understand, but but God is molding each one of us because He's got to change each one of us into a more Christ-like image. But before I get too far into that too, I do want to say that there is some change that's not good. Not good. Change is good when it pushes us closer to God. When it draws us nearer to Him and makes us more like Him. That's a good change. But when change pushes us away from revealed truth, when it pushes us away from God's Word, when we are more like the world, and we take on the attributes of the world versus the attributes of Christ, then there's a big problem. There's a huge problem. You know, we've got people today that are changing in the wrong direction. Some may even be born-again Christians, but they're changing in the wrong direction. They're changing in a way that, that's not pushing them closer to being like the Lord. They're, they're going in a direction that's in, that's in the opposite way, more like the world. And God's not orchestrating that change. You know, the Bible mentions in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, that in our day, now the Spirit is speaking expressly, that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. In other words, what does it mean? They had the faith. But they're departing from it. They're walking away from God. They're walking away from, from righteousness and holiness. And they're walking away. And how, how what's what's orchestrating that? Well, it says as it goes on, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. In other words, Satan, and through his deceptive minions, are coming by and whispering things in their ears and saying, You don't need to take that harvest stand. You know what? You don't need to be as be righteous. Uh, you don't need to, you know, what everybody else is doing it. I mean, look at all those other churches that are, you know, they drop the standards. And, you know, you can you can go up there and walk around in a miniskirt and, and everyone will applaud you. And you can walk around and, and, and look like the world and act like the world and, 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 and dress like the world and talk like the world and, and watch the things the world likes. And you know what? And it doesn't matter because everybody's doing it. You know, that's the phrase. Everybody's doing it. And they begin to uh, go away from the godly convictions. And they begin to go away from the word of God. And they begin to what? Give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience here with a hot iron. In other words, they, they, they're numb to it. They're numb to it. And I, I know, I've known people who have had high standards and have done things righteously and have striven for it. Not that they were perfect, but then all of a sudden over the course of time, it's like they, they kind of let down their guard a little bit. They kind of let things down, you know, uh, skip the church a little bit now and then. It's not a big deal. And they, they start, uh, you know, other things mean, mean more to them than the things of God and, and so forth. And they're letting down the guard. They're letting things down. And that's the wrong way to change. If things... If we're involved in things that are taking our heart away from God and changing our heart, it could be we're giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's what we, we see in this passage here. And that's the wrong kind of change. When we compromise on revealed truth, we will end up in error every time. See, there's no secondary truth. There's no, there's no a substitution truth. There's only one truth. That's the Word of God. And without, and if we go away from that, there's nowhere else to go but error. And the more error we embrace, the further we get away from God. That's why the Bible warns in Proverbs 24, 21, My son, fear thou the Lord and the King, and meddle not with them that are given to change. And we have a Christianity in this country that's changing, that's trying to keep one step behind the world, but the world's going further and further in the gutter, and, and they're going further and further with it. They're just a few steps behind it. And that's not the direction we want to go. We want to stand balanced on the, on, on the Bible. We want to stay biblical. We don't want to just keep following the world. You know, there's things going on in churches today, 50 years ago, they would have just uh, had a, 
had a fit over. They're changing in the wrong direction. It's not more like Christ. It's more, how can we make Jesus more culturally acceptable in this day and age? How can we make him more, more worldly? How can we bring more of the world into the, into the house of God? How much of the world can we bring into our own homes? That's the wrong kind of change. Now you can, you can have the flip side too and start changing and go far to the right and be, be into every little thing that, that, and, and, and you know, straining in gnats and swallowing camels. That, that's another extreme. I, I won't get into that so much today, but you know, we want to strive for biblical balance. Being biblically balanced. And that's a hard thing. And that's, that's something that takes time to learn. But as people embrace more and more error, it gets to the point they embrace so much error that they begin to call evil good and good evil. The Bible mentions in Isaiah 50 verse 20, or chapter 5 verse 20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You know, in our society today, uh, Bible believers are, and, and, their, and their doctrine, if you will, is considered not socially acceptable, is it? It's not politically correct. They call it evil. Right? But they call everything that God calls evil an abomination. They call that, that's good. That's good. That's diversity, you know? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, we, we got an issue here. We can't call what God, what God calls evil, God means it's evil. What God calls good, that's what's good. God's the judge of good and evil, not us. We respond to his definition, not the world's. The world's definition is changing all the time. It's changing all the time. In fact, in, in Isaiah's day, there were people that wanted the preachers to change their message. He said, don't, don't tell us the biblical things. Tell us things that just tickle our ears. Isaiah 30, verses 9 through 11. This is God talking. He says that this is a rebellious people. Lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, the seers are, are the preachers. See not, in other words, preach not, unto the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy to cease. That's interesting. Tell us lies. Lie to us. It's okay. As long as it sounds good, makes us feel good, that's all that matters. Whether it's true or not, we don't really care about truth. And it says, get you out of the way, turn aside out of, out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Oh, that's, that's strong language. In other words, we don't want to hear what God has to say. We'll worship God, but according to our own dictates. And if you have to, go ahead and lie to us. And there preachers even today that would be more than happy to tell you that the Bible is not true, that, that you don't have to take anything literally. I mean, they're all over the place. But that doesn't please the Lord. You know, we have today secular humanists that want to make themselves into their own gods. A man is his own god. He can do whatever he wants. He can set the morals of right and wrong. We're starting to see the fruit of that in our nation. But then you have Christianity, too, that's trying to make, again, God culturally acceptable by making Jesus as worldly as possible. You know, this past week I received a flyer in my mailbox at home uh, from a church in our, in our neck of the woods. And I, I saw, you know, some of the things they said on there wasn't necessarily bad, but then they showed some pictures. And one of the pictures showed a rock concert. It looked like a rock concert in there. And, you know, people were jamming on this, like, it's interesting. Who, who are they trying to emulate? God or the world? God or the world? And that's very vibrant in this day and age. Of course, their argument is that's how you get people in the door. You give them what they want. You know, can I say this? A church is not a business. We're not selling anything. We're not, we're, we're, we're not, we don't have anything to sell. We have everything to give. And that giving is not what people want. It's giving what God tells us to give people the word of God. The seeker sensitive philosophy, though, is, is a consumer-based mentality. You, you do what brings the people in. It doesn't matter. 
I don't know, there are certain things they may won't do, but, but at the same time, too, it, there's a big problem with that. It puts people in chairs, yes, but there's no change in the heart. Around here, we're trying to get people's hearts changed towards God. Not just trying to fill a bunch of chairs. And you pay a price for that. But I'd rather pay a price now than up there when I stand before God. And as a church, we, we feel the same way. The Bible says in 1 John 2, verses 15 and 17, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It's not talking about the people of the world. It's talking about the world system, the world's mentality, the philosophies, the mentality uh, of this world. Which the Bible says the whole world lieth in wickedness in the same book, 1 John chapter, uh, chapter 5, I believe. Why would God want us to emulate something that does not love Him? For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but neither do the will of God abideth forever. It's not about being more like the world, it's being more like Christ. And those groups will claim that they are, but they're anything but that. They're anything but that. I had one of them contact me asking me if I could go on, if, if I wanted to hurry up and get on the schedule so that he could get pop to our teenagers. And, and I said no. And I went on to tell him, look, this is what makes Christianity a joke in our society. That's what makes it so weak. It has no standards, no convictions about anything anymore. And I, I, I just mentioned a few things in the email. And I got an email back a few days later. Well, you're entitled to your opinion. But God's got an opinion on some of this stuff. He really does. Well, you can put people in chairs, but it doesn't change their heart. It doesn't matter how many people get in chairs. We want to make people in chairs too, but what I'm hearing, uh, I'm hearing for people's hearts to change towards them. That's the difference. Nowhere in, in Scripture does it advocate that we act or resemble the world and its philosophy of life. You know, in our country right now, it's all about pleasure. It's all about parties, one weekend to the next. It's not about worshiping God. You know, if, if you get a little God in, great. You know, that's good. I'm not wrong with that. But, but it's all about pleasure. I just read this morning. Uh, I can't remember exactly. I think it was in First Timothy. It makes a statement in there. She that loveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. You know, people that are so pleasure-oriented, <coughs> party-oriented, you know, pampering self-oriented, they're living a dead life. And I know that's true because I've lived that life for 20 years. My life. Just doing whatever hearts desire. It doesn't matter if it's right or wrong or not. It doesn't matter if, you know, get a little God in. That's, not, that's a good thing. You kind of just bolster things up with you and God a little bit. No, it's, it's kind of all or nothing. You in or you out? Well, doesn't God just want us to be happy? No. The whole mentality shift for some. Oh, God doesn't want us to be happy. He wants us to be holy. When we're holy, then we'll be happy. That's how it works. See, when we're not holy, that means we're entrenched and soaking up sin. What does the Bible say about sin? Sin, when it's finished, bring forth. Yeah. Every one of our problems is related somehow to sin. God, if we can push the sin out, the joy of the Lord that's within our hearts shines forth. So I don't, I don't feel that. I'm, well, maybe you ought to check out your salvation and your walk with God if you are convinced you are sinning. Just tell them yourself. Real biblical change that holy into holiness and righteousness in our lives has to take place. And that real biblical change is conforming the sinful flesh into a holy vessel meet for the master's use. And that's a change God's interest in. You're not interested in that. You can't prove it any other way. In order to see change or 
how this equation works, growth equals change. Let's talk about a few things here this morning. First off, we're going to change. We've got to have some teachableness. Teachableness. Verses 19 and 20 in our passage, who being past feeling have given themselves over into lasciviousness, the work all uncleanness, but greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. Paul here communicates the fact that these Ephesian Christians in that church there have been taught many things in regards to change. He had, he had, they had learned some things about what God expected of them. <coughs> Verse 22, that he put off concerning the former conversation the old man. In other words, if you're truly saved, it's time to start shedding the old ways. The old man, if you will. And putting on the new man. Verse 24, put on the new man, which is after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. In fact, earlier in this passage, we didn't read it, but God tells how He has given some things. He's given a New Testament church, He's given a, the Word of God, and He's given the Holy Spirit to teach us to bring about the change. Look at verse 11. It says, And He gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, and it was for the perfecting of the saints. Speaking of the spiritual maturing, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying the body of Christ, in other words, so that they can be an asset for God, not a liability, till we all come in unity of faith of the one knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, a mature man, spiritually, under the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ. Notice verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine. You know, there's, there's so many ideas and philosophies, even, even ones that, that supposedly have rooted out of the Word of God. And of course, we got the Internet today, and that's exploded. People watch things on YouTube all the time. They get in these all different directions, and they get concerned about uh, everything happening in the world. And you know what? God wants us rooted and rooted in this Word. That'll help us from getting all up, up in arms about this potential thing happening, and that potential thing happening, and that potential thing happening, and that conspiracy theory coming to pass, and so forth. All that does provide instability in the lives of people. That's the wind being tossed to and fro. You know, whipping over here, whipping over here, whipping over here. No, he wants us grounded and rooted in him so that when the when those winds of, of, of goofy doctrine come flowing our way, we don't move. We don't move at all. By the sight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth and love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now, God has given the, the New Testament church, the Holy Spirit of God, and His Word for the growth of the Word of, of, of God's people to help in the changing process. And these tools were to help people understand what is right and what is wrong. Because God is big on instruction. He doesn't want His people to be ignorant. In fact, in Hosea chapter number 4, I believe it's verse... In the 12 or 16, the Bible says that uh, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You know why people get tripped up spiritually? Because they don't know the spiritual truths that they know. Maybe it's because they've missed the sermon that they were supposed to hear. Or they don't spend time in the Word of God and let God teach them as the Holy Spirit reveals things to them. We cut our own throat spiritually. We're going to stumble spiritually very quickly. We're going to be blown about with every wind of doctrine very quickly. If we don't allow God to use those tools to change us. But God is being on instruction. It's part of the Great Commission. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Speaking of the preaching of the gospel. Of course, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, but teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and though I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. That teaching them to observe all things. That's the discipleship process. That's what you get every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night here. That's what you get when you get into the Word of God yourself and read and study. That's what you get when you pray. People tell on themselves all the time that they're not doing some of that stuff by when they start getting blown around all over the place. Now, a person can have the most dynamic, articulate teacher. However, 
The information must be received as well. We must be teachable people. It's an attitude that we don't know about, that we haven't arrived, and that we still have some growing to do. There was a preacher who gave an unusual sermon one day. He used a peanut to illustrate several things about the Bible. One of the members greeted him at the door of the service and said, You know, Pastor, it's very interesting. I never expected to learn so much from a nut. It's kind of a double meaning to think about it. What do you mean? Oh, there's so much to learn. I think it was, it was George Washington Carver, the one who, who developed all that stuff from that. It, from my understanding, it's a question. He said, you know, uh, God, he asked God to show him the, the wonders of the, of the universe and so forth, and God taught him a lot about the peanuts. <laughs> He's like, that was about my love. We got so much to learn, don't we? We should never just, of course, change our minds on, on things the instant we hear them, because that just means we're, in, we're very unstable. But we should be willing to at least consider, you know, what God is trying to communicate to us. You know, sometimes we're wrong on things. Sometimes we need some more understanding of things. Sometimes we need to relearn things. That's the kind of spirit that pleases the Lord. I remember years ago when I was out door knocking, when we first started here, I knocked on the door and I just advised, you know, there's an older couple in the church, and, and uh, the husband came up and real rough with me. He was like, I'm part of this denomination. I won't change for nothing. Walked away and like, oh, you're real teachable. I was just inviting. By the way, I know what that person, what he believed in it. I wasn't in line with this and all that, especially when it came to the point of salvation. Forget all other doctrines for the moment. He didn't have, didn't have salvation on but, but it's that unteachable, prideful spirit that we cannot have. You know, we have to have the attitude of the Berean people. Mentioned in the book of Acts, verses, uh, chapter 17, verse 11. These were more noble than those of Thessalonica, speaking of the Bereans, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind. And notice, they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. They were teachable, but they went back to their Bibles. They understood that they were personally responsible for what they believed, and, and that they gave a fair hearing, and they made decisions for themselves. That's a teachable spirit. And if we're going to grow, we need to be teachable. If we're going to be determined to be stuck in our ways, we'll never grow. And keep plunking the same lessons over and over again. But guess what? God's going to keep having you take that test. He doesn't, oh, okay, we're just going to move on here. No, God will keep us on the same test until we get it right. God, God has a way of, of uh, changing us. And, and, you know, God's got all the time in the world. We don't. So we need to have that attitude of teachableness. Secondly, there must be tossing. Tossing. Now, before somebody comes to Christ and salvation, they have a way of living. I had it. Those of you who saved here are, had it. It's verse 17. This I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that he henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. The Gentiles speaking here are the unsaved. In the vanity of their mind. In other words, they came up with ideas that were just vain, empty, worthless, void. Verse 18, having the understanding darkened. In other words, they don't understand spiritual things. Being alienated from the life of God. In other words, they have no connection with God, no matter how religious they may appear to be. Through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to the lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. In other words, uh, the lost person lives according to their heart's desires and lusts. That's the way the unsaved person lives. Look at chapter 2 and verse uh, verse 2, Paul writes to them, actually pick up verse 1, And you have he quickened, who are dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the earth, that's Satan, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we have all had our conversation in times past, in other words, we had the same lifestyle, in the lust of our flesh, Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, or by nature the children of wrath, even as others. In other words, as a lost person, a lost person lives their life according to the dictates of whatever their heart's desire is. It doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. It's according to the desires and the lusts of the flesh. It's a sinful lifestyle. One that pursues sin to varying degrees. But the day somebody gets truly saved, the day that they actually recognize their lost condition, recognize they're on the road to hell, and recognize that if they turn to Christ with all their 
heart and trust Him alone as their Savior, letting Him be the Lord of their life, they will be saved. The day they get that, their lives, God will begin to change their lives from the inside out. Second Chronicles, or Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ saved, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and all things are become new. In other words, there should be a, a change going on. It doesn't happen. It's not one hundred percent right away, but there is a process that begins. And everyone comes into salvation different, with different baggage, if you will, from the unsaved life. And it takes God very amounts of time to change the individual. A change He will. Something that helps speed up the process again is willing is a willingness to toss former the former life aside. That's what we we see being mentioned here in verse seventeen in Ephesians four that He henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. In other words, don't walk. In other words, don't act. Don't go the same direction you were going in the past, and, and like the law, lost world does. But look at verse twenty two. But put off the former, uh, off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Again, the old man is the old wife. Real spiritual growth is shown when more of the old man, the old life, is being put aside, being tossed, and when the new life and the new man is put on. Again, it's the life that lived away from God and His Word. It's the life that lived contrary to God's revealed truth. It's a life that did whatever it pleased. That must be tossed. It must be put in the garbage, if you will. It must be shed. It's like a, like some clothes on that, that get dirty. That You have dirty clothes, you take them off, and you put clean ones on. That's exactly what God's trying to do in every single Christian's life. See, we can't embrace the new life without first tossing the old. Some Christians want to hold on to the old. They want to hold on to the same lifestyle. They want to hold on to that, but you can't. And God will continually bring things into your life if you're truly saved. If you're not truly saved, then you're going to be able to just keep doing what you're doing without much of God's intervention. Other than if somebody's praying for you to get saved. And God might be doing some things. But He's going to try to remove that stuff. Romans 6, verses 6 through 7 says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. In our modern evangelical circles today, you have this idea, Trump, that, well, we have liberty in Christ. Back away. Don't give me a bunch of news and notes. We've got liberty in Christ. It's a liberty that believe, basically believes that, again, you can live any way you want. Just add a little Jesus to you. But it's just as rebellious as those who want to live life away from Christ as a lost person. When you think about it. Don't shackle me with do's and notes. I'm not trying to shackle anybody. God's trying to say, buddy or ma'am, you need to live like I want you to live. Not in the vanity of your mind and chasing every little lust that, that comes into your heart. But you are to surrender your life to me. Because when that liberty that I've given you is a liberty not to be bonded by sin anymore. Not under the yoke of sin. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. We have the ability to say no to sin now, that we did not have to save people, or unsaved people. We have power over sin in Christ. And that liberty is not meant for the fulfillment of the lust of the flesh, but to do right according to the commandments of God. Galatians 5.13, For brethren, ye have been called into liberty. Only use not liberty for occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. And those that trump this idea that I have liberty in Christ, I can do whatever I want. Oh yeah, you can do whatever you want. But if you are truly Christ, God will deal with you. God will give you the spiritual spanking, if you will. That's, what, that's what's taught in Hebrews chapter number 12. We can't get away with it. The lust of the flesh, those sinful tendencies we all have, God is wanting us to toss those and put off that old man. And as God reveals areas in our lives that are not pleasing to Him, we are not to modify our sin. We're to mortify it. You know, a lot of people try to modify their sin. Well, I don't get drunk anymore. I just social drink. I'm like, wait a minute here. <laughs> You're modifying sin. <clears throat> You know, I don't listen to that nasty uh, music anymore. I listen to the Christian rock stuff. You know, that's a modifying of sin. 
We are mortifying. That's what the Bible teaches. We are mortifying our sin. That way, mortifying means put to death. In other words, cease to exist. Romans 8, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, but live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit be the most mortifying the deeds of the body, ye shall die. Mortify again means to put to death. That, that sin ceases to exist. Now, we'll never become sinless. Don't misunderstand that. But God's people should be growing so that they are sinning less than they are. <coughs> It's out with the old and in with the new. How are we doing today? Are we doing some tossing? Are we still holding on to some of those old relics from the past? Maybe it's time we need to put those on the altar and toss them. And get rid of them. Because if you're going to embrace the new life, you've got to let go of the old. There's no way of getting around that. That you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man. Former conversation of the Former lifestyle. If you are truly saved, now I'm saved, Pastor, for the Lord. Well, glad. If you're going to grow, which God has commanded and desires and will do in our lives, we've got to let go of the old life. God's, there's got to be some changes. Because growth equals change. If we hold on, there will be no more change. And by the way, if we resist the soft tools, you know, the soft, the, the file, you know, the file, if you will, of God's toolbox, God also has sledgehammers. And, <laughs> and God has God has some harsher tools to use. But He's gonna round those things out. And we can we can submit to it, or we can resist it. God will use the sledgehammer if he has to, but he, I think he'd rather use the final. But he's going to conform us one way or another if we're truly saved. If we're not, that's a whole other business. What he's trying to do is get you, get you saved and bring you into the fellowship with him. But there must be an out with the old and in with the new, as we see. Third, the turning. When we toss the old ways, we are then to turn to the new ways. 23, verse 23, Ephesians 4. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Then you put on the new man, which after God has created righteousness and true holiness. In other words, we learn and apply God's principles in life. That's the new man. The new man is one that's, that's growing in its understanding and application of God's principles and truths. Romans 12, 2 communicates the same thing. Be not to conform to this world. <laughs> Conform means image after this world. We're not to act, look, talk, walk like the world. But be transformed, changed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, the transformation of your mind. All with the old and with the new. That you may prove what is that good, perfect, uh, good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. In other words, you change so that we can fulfill God's will for our lives. We rid ourselves of the bad ways and embrace the new ways. And when we do, oh boy, then there is obvious good changes and obvious spiritual growth. It's a process known in Scripture as sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4, 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. That's the cleaning out of the old and renewing with the new. We help or hinder that process by the decisions that we make. It's a great thing. Because as we grow, as we apply ourselves to grow, as we make it a point to let God do His work in us, we begin to act and talk and walk through life more and more like Christ. And that's the goal. That's the goal. When native converts of the island of Madagascar used to present themselves for baptism, was often asked to them, what first led you to think of becoming Christians? The answer usually was that the changed conduct of others who had become Christians was the first that uh, arrested their attention. He says, I knew this man to be a thief, one said. One that was a drunkard, another was very cruel and unkind to his family. Now they are all changed. The thief is an honest man, the drunkard is sober and respectable, and the other is gentle and kind in his home. There must be something in a religion that can work such changes, the converts would say. 
You know, it's been said that if your religion doesn't change you, you ought to change your religion. <laughs> because real religion, if you if I can use it, my way can use it. Doctrine that changes lives is a doctrine that, I, I, I should say, a doctrine that changes lives into the image of Christ is a, is a doctrine that is very positive. One, a doctrine that doesn't do anything but allows people to continue to do whatever they want to do, that's, that, that's not right. Because God is interested in change. He's very interested in change. And when, that, when real change happens, when real turning happens, the putting on the new man, that's change you can really believe in. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing to behold the growth process of the Christian. Somebody who gets saved and, and uh, certain attributes of them begin to fall off. You know, before they never darkened the doors of the church, but now they're there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And they're there, uh, and they give, they tithe. And it's like they never gave a dime before, but now they tithe. You know, they never talk about God to anybody, but they begin to speak and tell people, and say, I don't know a lot, but you know, I know what happened to me, and, 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 and I just want other, you know what? No, that's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing to see that. And then we have to desire to do what God's will is for their life. It's not all about, you know, you know I've got my career plans, I got, you, know, I, you know, I've always dreamed of being rich and, and famous, and all, you know, all of a sudden those, those dreams and all those things start to fade away, and, and they begin to form, you know what, I want to do what God wants me to do. I tell you, that's some real change. Have you changed? Say, I, I'm saved, Pastor. Are you even changing in those areas? Are you still stumbling over square one? Now, we can be stubborn and resist change, but again, it'll result in no growth spiritually, which will amount to nothing but a floundering Christian existence at best. We must be allowing, or we must be willing to allow God to change who we are today. And every Christian here, every person that claims to be born again and saved, should be able to look back year after year and see results. Every year, you should be able to look back and say, you know, I can see God changing. I can see that going on. But for some, they look back and they see, well, I used to stand stronger here, but now today I think, well, I used to have a lot of joy in serving God, but now I don't serve anymore. I used to love going to the house of God, but I'm hitting this at best. I love doing, I, 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 I wanted to, I love the changes in my heart attitude, but now today I'm stubborn and irritable all the time. What does it look like in your past? A year, or two years, or a year, or however long? You should be able to see like the rings of a tree. But if there is no change, which you might see as a tree, that's not a good thing. It's not a good thing at all. God help us to understand this equation of growth equals change and embrace it for the Lord. For God's you know, you and I are here for a purpose, not to fulfill our own will, but to do His. In order to do His, we've got to change. If we're not willing to do that. Our Christian existence is empty. It's void. It's useless. But none of us want to be that way. I think we all like to say, oh, I'd like to do something for God. I'd like, I'd like some positive. Yeah. Maybe it's time to change. God help us to do so. Let's stand to our feet at this time.